where I tried to use a clicker. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Toby Lewis, and as you've heard there, uh, I am the Global Head of Threat Analysis for Darktrace. Now, Darktrace, for those that haven't come across us, we are trying to fuse the use of AI and machine learning, but for cybersecurity, and to try and understand how we can use this technology enabler to speed up the work that we do and to make our systems and to make our data more secure. But the challenge is, is that our data is in more places than it's ever been before. And with the dawn of ChatGPT and LLMs and all the kind of the hype around AI, a lot of focus has been around the dangers of AI itself, around the idea that the brain could go away with itself and start thinking up new ways to destroy us. But in reality, AI is a tool. AI is maths. AI is data science. And so really, the bits of risk here is not what the AI is doing, but what the data is doing and where the data has come from. So I want you to sort of cast your mind back 10, 15, maybe even not that long ago. You went into an office, you logged onto your corporate desktop, uh, you did your work, and then you left for the day. All of the IT that you touched that day was in a physical building, behind barbed wire fences, maybe with security guards, brick walls, kind of you name it. And the challenge was is that not, not just that your uh, physical devices were in one place, but so was your data. Your data never physically left the building. Okay, we've got email, but let's ignore that for the time being. And then over time, we started to evolve from the work that we were doing. And suddenly we brought in things like the cloud, we started to outsource more of the business services that we needed every day, and they inherently became connected online. And from a business perspective, this was great, because it meant that our users could now access their data, access their services from wherever they wanted to be. Now, just because your users can access the data from wherever they want to be, that can also mean so can attackers, and that is increasingly a challenge wherever our data goes. Now look, I look at this from a business lens, but what about us as people? Think about the photos that you take. 10 years ago, you took your photos on a, digital, on a physical camera, maybe onto a digital camera, and you held those photos in your hands. You printed them out, you stuck them on a wall. The challenge is, though, is that we don't really do that anymore. The photos that we take, we post online. We upload to Facebook, we upload to Instagram, we store on Google Docs or OneDrive. You don't really own your photos, you access them. And I think increasingly more and more of our data, whether it's photos, whether it's personal data, is now accessed via another means, accessed somewhere else. Your data is now fundamentally all over the internet. And then kind of COVID happened. And okay, we'd been starting to do this whole remote work thing for a while, but COVID kind of really enforced it upon us. And more specifically, we all started working from home probably many of us are still there. Certainly I am still working from home almost entirely. And that would have been the very, very different world three, four, five years ago. And so not only is the data now walking out the building, but those physical devices that you once entrusted to be that additional layer of security is now causing you additional worries and pain from a security perspective. Now, Look, if I'm going to talk about sort of cybersecurity, if I'm going to talk around the, the risks of your networks, the risks of your data, um, there's always a challenge that, you know, am I here to talk about the doomsday scenario? Am I here to talk about the catastrophizing of how AI might be used for bad? But it's always worth pausing to reflect that AI genuinely is a force for good. That ability to process huge volumes of data, that ability to look for things that are otherwise difficult for the human being to spot. Patterns that are hard to see or um, data sets that are hard to process in huge, huge volumes. And so we've got some examples on the screen here where AI generally is truly innovative and providing some great breakthroughs. For example, the one at the top left where it's improving breast cancer detection rates by up to 13%. And improvements are still going. Now the challenge is when you think about where your data is, AI is a really powerful tool to process all of that bulk data. Thinking about the fact that your data now lives online. Thinking about your personal photos. Thinking about your business life now living online. If you go back to, was it 2014? And suddenly we saw all of those celebrities who had their iCloud accounts hacked and all their personal photos, some more personal than others, leaked online. 
And that's because we'd been from a world where our data was protected by that previous world of fences and barbed wire and bricks and mortar and everything else. And the physical security was part of the protection. And now we placed it online for anyone to access. And that's the same true in the business world, the business concept, as we move more and more of our email services to things like Office 365 and, and Google Docs and Google Cloud. There was a cyber attack back in 2017 against the UK Houses of Parliament, where uh, an attacker basically tried to guess the password of members of Parliament. Now, you'd like to think that there was a relatively good level of security going on there. They are parliamentarians, they are heads of state. Um, but around 80 accounts were compromised in that attack just by simply trying to guess the password that was being used. And so, as I said, if your users can access your data anywhere, so can an attacker. Now, we've been using AI within Darktrace for the last 10 years or more. And whilst we've looked at it from a defensive perspective, it's always worth looking about how an attacker could use it. So we asked our AI to target me, to target me with a phishing email. Could it trick me? Now, when we think about AI targeting an individual, we talk about the idea of coming up with highly crafted emails that are uh, incredibly complex, lots and lots of written prose that you just basically fall through every single time. And don't get me wrong, there are absolutely examples in what our AI generated that I go, That's, that actually feels quite believable. The text is quite sort of uh, detailed and complex. You know, you wouldn't have expected, particularly, for example, a non-English speaker to come up with something like that. But these are two that really stood out to me because the really important factor here is not the structure, is not the format, which you could argue are, is relatively templated, relatively formulaic. Actually, these are relatively common emails I receive all the time. The context here is key. Mike Beck is my boss and the AI worked that out. And so it sent me an email with a list of tasks that he wanted me to open. It's not about the structure, it's about the context, about knowing what will trigger me to open up that email. And likewise, this one on the right-hand side, um, the email itself is from Dave. Dave's a co-worker of mine. We both report into Mike. Again, it, the AI is exploiting that relationship context to target me. It doesn't have to be complex English, fancy graphics. It just needs to understand relationships. It needs to understand human behaviors for it to really, really work and get the most out of it. No, fine, okay. So the video that I was gonna show you um, is a video clip generated by AI, by actually a online tool, actually a mobile app that I have on my personal phone. Um, and it allows you to create um, uh, videos of celebrities. In this case, you can see I was clicking to show you a video of Donald Trump saying a few things that he probably didn't want to. Um, and the key thing here is, is that you can do this online for anyone really. If you have enough video imagery about an individual, if you have enough audio clips about somebody, you can mimic them incredibly authentically. Now, what we, had on, what we would have had on here would have been Donald Trump talking about how generative AI uh, can cause huge levels of privacy risks. And I think that's incredibly true. If you think about all of your data is everywhere. And we're now starting to see that weaponized by attackers. In fact, we saw it only recently in the last couple of weeks um, where a organization, a financial organization, was tricked into transferring huge volumes of money because they'd received a video call from people they thought were on their C-suite. It turns out the majority of people on that video call were generative AI actors. And actually the only real person was the person receiving the call in the first place. But it was believable enough that they thought it was true and transferred significant sums of money. And we're starting to see some of the tooling around ChatGPT and all the other innovations around that being turned around by attackers for additional tooling. And so when we open source, when we saw the tooling become open source right at the start of, was it October, November 2022, I think, um, the challenge was, was how could that tooling be used for bad? And straight away, you see attackers taking that technology, repurposing it for what they want to use it for with this tool here, Worm GPT, which allows an attacker to generate malware, to generate new viruses that maybe haven't been seen before. And now it's really easy just to download this. And if you've never written your own piece of malware before, well, here I introduce you a new handy tool for doing so. 
And so kind of governments have started to wake up and realize that actually we need to take the cybersecurity and AI kind of overlap really, really quite seriously. And we've seen two, um, uh, two packages of work come out in the last kind of couple of months, really. Uh, one from the Biden administration, one from uh, here in the UK at Bletchley Park last year, where there was a real meeting of minds, a real meeting of AI, security, tech leaders, but also government leaders from around the world, trying to solve the challenge of AI when it comes to cybersecurity. Now, for the most part, what these focus on is about the use of AI in critical infrastructure, in systems and services that all of our lives rely on, and essentially making sure that we're still going to be safe at the end of it. Um, it's about looking about how AI is applied to safety critical systems. It's looking about how maybe sensitive data is processed about us. And that is absolutely the right thing to be considering to make sure that the big commercial applications of AI are ethical and moral and actually give us a real uh, level of assurance about the work we're getting out of them. The challenge with any regulation is that it's only the good guys that follow the regulation. And actually, if a lot of the underlying algorithms that underpin AI are already in the public domain, actually, there's the capacity for attackers to still use AI. Um, unfortunately, um, it's only the good guys that, that tend to be held back a little bit. So some of the work that we've been doing at Darktrace has been then trying to, I suppose, take another look at AI, trying to look at ways in which AI can be used from a cybersecurity perspective, not by attackers, but by defenders. And so from my perspective, it's a case of what can we do to look at the security of our uh, customers' networks to use the power of AI to really uh, accelerate our ability to protect them from attacks. And if we look over the last couple of years, there's been some real milestone moments in the cybersecurity landscape where there have been big, huge security breaches often perpetrated by capability and techniques that haven't been seen before. Uh, we had solar winds a few years ago, allegedly by, by the Russian government, using an attack that wasn't seen until it was far, far too late. We had an attack against uh, email servers all over the world by a group known as Hafnium, again, using a capability that wasn't known about until it'd been used for three, four, five months at will across the entire internet. Now, for many organizations, cybersecurity, they are unfortunately very reactive to those sorts of environments. They kind of have to wait for it to be caught. They have to be, wait for it to be found somewhere else, and then you learn from that other person's mistakes. It is the sort of the sacrificial lamb approach to cybersecurity. Somebody else has to get compromised first, and then you learn about it. From our perspective, there was a question of how could we use AI to detect an attack that we didn't already know was bad, and there was no other evidence that it was even compromised in the first place. And so one of the challenges we looked at was rather than trying to hunt for the attackers, rather than trying to use the AI to hunt out the malicious code and the malicious activity, why can't we use AI to look for effectively anything that isn't the organizations we're defending? Because the idea being is that if it's not one of you, well, then who is it? And why is it there? And how did it get there? And that really, really has lowered the threshold for us in terms of being able to detect attacks that... Again, people have no idea are there, and two, people don't yet know are bad. And so the last thing I want to leave us on, as I'm coming very close to time, is my prediction. We've spoken around some of the concerns around how um, our data is now everywhere, how with the power of generative AI, it gives the ability for attackers to generate incredibly realistic imagery. It gives an attacker the ability to create highly targeted phishing emails, including targeting me. But actually, one of the things that we're starting to see is the ability for defenders to now start to use AI to kind of take the fight back. And so I suppose my prediction here is that the world will move to where AI-enabled defenders are pitting their wits against AI-enabled attackers. And I'm fairly confident to say that at the back end of this, the good guys will win. Thank you.